Good morning. Good morning. Uh, well, like Evra said, my name is Jordan Arsenault, and uh, my wife and I are some of the founding members of the South Suburban Vineyard Church almost 14 years ago in November. Um, I'm so ex excited to be speaking to you this morning, and I also want to welcome those who are visiting for the very first time. Welcome. I also want to recognize those who are watching on Facebook and on YouTube and our iTunes podcast and through our website. Uh, you're more than welcome to visit with us here in Flossmore if you're in the neighborhood. Um, so recently I had the honor of working on a docu-series called Trouble on Tap. And um, this series is all about water insecurity. And it covers issues of droughts and floods and um, toxicity and scarcity of drinking water in the United States. And so far we've done interviews about uh, dried up lakes in California and we've done interviews about uh, PFAS, which is uh, basically scientists call these forever chemicals um, that are in uh, the Cape Fear River in North Carolina. And in the latest episode of Trouble on Tap, uh, we featured Chicago's 380,000 lead pipe service lines that uh, go into people's houses and the city's effort to provide uh, filters and education um, Lead poisoning is very, very bad for the brain. Um, uh, and over time, people get exposed to, to lead. And um, I got to visit some of these houses. And it's, it's kind of crazy what homeowners have to deal with in order to have clean water for, for cooking. Um, and uh, needless to say, I've gotten to see up and close how the issue of water security is a life and death situation, as water is an essential part of life. We drink with it, we cook with it, we grow with it, we wash our dishes with it, we wash our clothes with it, we wash ourselves with it. It's an elemental gift God has given us on this earth to help us survive and thrive. One of the first things that astrobiologists look for when they're looking for aliens on other planets is water because water is an elemental part of life. Last winter, my family and I learned just how elemental water is for daily living. On Christmas Eve, I heard this loud boom come from the upstairs bathroom on our second floor, and when I came inside of it, water was gushing out of the wall like a high-powered hose. And a pipe had burst uh, because of the extreme cold temperatures. So I had to turn off the water at the water line and um, wait until a plumber could come. But since it was Christmas, they couldn't come for two days. So basically, we had to survive without water for a couple of days, and you don't know how much you need it until you don't have it anymore. Clean tap water was just something that I had taken for granted up until this point. Jesus says this in John chapter 7. Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And the writer John has this bracketed note. When he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit, who would be given to everyone believing in him. Jesus describes the Holy Spirit as living water a phrase that he used another time when he talked to the woman at the well. The Spirit of God is an essential source, just like water. But instead of refreshment, it provides a strength, meaning, guidance, conviction, and power for followers of Jesus. That said, the Holy Spirit can be a touchy subject in the church because its manifestation can be in scarce supply in some congregations. That, and, and, and also, in other contexts, it's become toxic because of hype and manipulation um, around the supernatural. But whether we choose to ignore the Holy Spirit or we overemphasize its gifts, we're exhorted in Scripture to live by its power, which points us to Jesus. It's an absolutely essential part of life 
as a Christian. Today I have the privilege of continuing a teaching series that we're simply calling Explore. And it's all about life, faith, and meaning in our walk with Christ. And we're basing this series off the world-famous Alpha Course, a video-based teaching series that was started by a man named Nicky Gumbel in the UK. The Alpha Course has gone around to churches all over the world, including right here at SSB. Through its question-based approach, Alpha has brought many people to saving faith by helping them wrestle and help answer some of life's biggest questions in a safe, non-confrontational, non-judgmental way. Millions of people have tried Alpha, and it's been translated into 112 languages. So in an effort to engage the Christian basics for new believers and old believers alike, we're going to be jogging through the Alpha Course questions in hopes of exploring life, faith, and meaning in the Christian life. In the first week of the series, our founding pastor, Gino, asked and helped answer the question, is there more to life? And in the following week, Lauren, our prayer ministry coordinator, helped us wrestle with the questions of why and how do we pray? Pastor Shannon gave us reasons and tips for why and how to read the Bible. And last week, Pastor David helped explain the means by which God guides every believer. For this week, I have the pleasure to talk about someone really important to everyone who calls himself a Christian, the Holy Spirit. It's a subject that I've preached about many times this year. I've been on stage. It seems like every time I'm on stage, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. But today, I'm going to help wrestle with and answer two important questions. Who is the Holy Spirit, and how can I be filled? Who is the Holy Spirit? And how can I be filled? So we're going to jog through the Alpha Course questions during this talk. And uh, before we do that, let me pray. Come Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you. Your presence is here. I was here during worship, Lord. We could feel you. And so we just ask that you come once more, Father. I pray that you would put this subject on a really low shelf, Father. I pray that you would re remove any nervousness uh, about the Holy Spirit, Father. I, I pray, Father, that you would remove any myths about the Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray, Father, that uh, our ears would just be open to hear what you have to say. I praise you and thank you for the Alpha Course and how many people that it's helped. And I pray, Father, that it would, it would help people today understand you more clearly. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, who is the Holy Spirit? Um, you know, it's Halloween time, and we see lots of decorations around, and you see ghosts. You know, when I was growing up in, in my churches, we didn't, I didn't do Halloween parties. We did hallelujah parties. And um, we didn't tell ghost stories. We told Holy Ghost stories. Um, but when Christians talk about the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of God, uh, what do they mean? Well, in Christian theology, across all branches and denominations of Christian belief, followers of Jesus believe in a doctrine called the Trinity, which says that God exists at all times as one God, but as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the way we wrap around our minds around this mystery is that the Spirit is the means by which every Christian experiences God now that Jesus isn't with us in bodily form. In John 16, Jesus says this to the, his disciples before he's betrayed and arrested. And by the way, you can follow along in your Bible. If you have a phone or a tablet with the Bible app, you can follow along. We'll also have this, the scriptures on the screens in front of you, and there's Bibles at the edges of each road. John chapter 16 Verses five, verse 5. But now I am going away to the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking where I am going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. He's talking about the Holy Spirit here. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin, and of God's righteousness, and of the coming judgment. 
The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father, and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. There is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. But he will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. So in our present day, Jesus is now at the right hand of the Father, but he left us an advocate, the Holy Spirit. So now we experience Jesus and the love of the Father through the Spirit present with us now. But this begs the question, what has the Holy Spirit been doing up until this point? I mean, if the Holy Spirit is the third person in the Trinity, he can't have just shown up just as Jesus is leaving. Well, the following is a comprehensive history of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. This is like Holy Spirit 101. Uh, there's a lot of scripture that I'm going to bring up, and so it might be hard to follow along. But I just want to pull out some of the highlights of the Spirit's activity in the Bible. And the truth is that the Holy Spirit has been present since the beginning. It says in Genesis 1, verse 1, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So since the beginning, the Holy Spirit is the creative force bringing, out, uh, bringing order out of chaos in chapter 1 of Genesis and then breathing life into humanity in chapter 2. The Holy Spirit also shows up when he comes upon particular people at particular times for particular tasks. Later on in Genesis, Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams by the power of the Spirit. In Exodus, God's Spirit is, fills Bezalel and other craftsmen with special skills to work on in the temple. The book of Judges records the Holy Spirit coming upon Gideon and clothing him with power, and coming upon Samson and clothing him in strength. When King Saul begins to prophesy under the influence of the Holy Spirit in the book of 1 Samuel, uh, people said, what? Even Saul is a prophet? The Holy Spirit was working through specific people at specific times and places for the purposes that God wanted to accomplish. But later, we'll see the Holy Spirit speaking through the prophets and in the prophetic books that things are going to change and that the Holy Spirit is going to be less discriminating. In Jeremiah 31, the Lord says through the prophet, I will put my instructions deep within them and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord, for everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord. In Ezekiel 36, the Lord says, And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. And famously, in Joel 2, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit on, even, on servants, men and women alike. So the Holy Spirit will dwell inside of people. From the beginning, the Spirit is at work in creation, and then he fills specific people for specific tasks. But God speaks to the prophets that at a time is coming when God's Spirit is going to dwell inside of people. However, these prophecies remain unfulfilled for hundreds of years until Jesus shows up. When Jesus comes along, things start to get weird again. There's great activity in the Spirit on specific people. The Holy Spirit comes upon John the Baptist, and it comes upon Mary, the mother of Jesus, and it comes on Mary's cousin, Elizabeth, and Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah, and a man named Simeon. Then John the Baptist links up with 
Jesus at his baptism. And this is what we read in Luke 3. As he was praying, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved Son, and you bring me great joy. Jesus received the power of the Holy Spirit at his baptism, and he was filled. As he was tempted in the desert, and as he returned to Galilee and began his ministry, he was preaching good news to the poor. He was recruiting disciples, healing the sick. He was casting out demons and proclaiming the kingdom of God under the influence of the Holy Spirit. As we read before in John 7, Jesus predicts that the Holy Spirit will come. Anyone who is thirsty, come to him and rivers of living water will flow. And he described the Holy Spirit as the advocate, a helper or counselor who is the spirit of truth, convicting us of our sin and pointing us to the coming judgment. Jesus was then crucified on the cross and the sins of humanity and raised to life again after three days in the tomb. He appears to the disciples in a glorified body and begins teaching them. And he says this in Luke 24. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Then Jesus is raised into the clouds and the disciples waited for the Holy Spirit to come as Jesus had instructed. And in Acts chapter 2, we read this on the day of Pentecost. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven, like a roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages, as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. And they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. The disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit that day. And they received new languages and a new boldness and new power to spread the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and everywhere else. And Luke says in the book of Acts that 3,000 people were added to their number that day by the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter says this in Acts 2. Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. So that brings us to today, right? We are those who are far off or far away. Today we live in the age of the Spirit, that God has promised to give every Christian his Spirit. Amen? So, what does the Spirit do? That's a good question to ask. Um, have you ever met someone and uh, they say what their job is, but you don't really know what they do? <laughs> um, this is my experience as a TV producer. Um, when you tell someone you're a TV producer, they don't they don't really know what to do with that. Like, what do you, what do, you do? What are you producing? I talked to David Jacob before the, the sermon started, and he's, he's an engineer. And so I asked, asked him, like, when you say you're an engineer, do people understand what an engineer does? And he's like, yeah, you know, some people, but not very many. I mean, if we're Christians, we should know what the Holy Spirit does. Amen? Um, if it's absolutely essential for every life of a Christian, then it matters. If it's, if it's like water, you know, water is important for cooking, cleaning, um, keeping us alive. Uh, how important is God's Spirit? Well, Jesus said in John 3 that the Spirit, through the Spirit, we are born again. We are born again. That the Holy Spirit gives us a new spiritual life. We are born again into a new family through Jesus and become sons and daughters of God. Uh, Paul says a lot about what the Holy Spirit does in Acts chapter 8. Um, he says that the Holy Spirit frees us from the power that leads to death, that allowing the Holy Spirit to control us prevents us from sinning, uh, that it promotes peace in our hearts and in our minds, and that the Spirit gives life to our bodies in the same way that it raised Christ Jesus from the dead, and that all who are led by the Spirit are children of God. The Holy Spirit offers forgiveness and adoption into God's family. Through Christ, we receive the closest intimacy with the Father 
The deepest experience of love and the greatest security of salvation. God is so rich in his mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead in our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ Jesus from the dead. Now all of us can come to the Father in the name of the Son through the power and the intimacy of the Holy Spirit. Living in the Spirit, living in the power of the Holy Spirit, it changes us. The Holy Spirit communes with us and it helps us pray and enables us to understand God's Word by His grace. And as we obey God's Word, we grow in likeness to Christ, becoming more like Him. And as we become more like Him, we become unified as a family in Christ. And like all families, each member is different and is equipped with different gifts of the Spirit. Free gifts to each one of us for the common good of all. The Holy Spirit empowers us to be witnesses for Christ and empowers us to serve other people. And Paul says that there's this fruit of the Spirit that should be present if you know someone who's a Christian. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Holy Spirit is the water of life, the living water promised in advance so God could be close to us when we were drained of all hope, when the toxicity of this world was too much, and when our lives became dry and meaningless. So we've learned who the Holy Spirit is, and we've learned what the Holy Spirit does. The next logical question is, if the Holy Spirit is as essential as water, how can I be filled? Jesus is recorded as saying this on the last page of the Bible, Revelation 22. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let anyone who hears this, come. Let anyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit living within them. That's what it means to be a Christian. Paul says if anyone does not have the Holy Spirit, they don't belong to Christ. But there seems to be a difference between having the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because Paul writes in to the church in Ephesus to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He contrasted being filled with the Holy Spirit with being drunk. Um, he says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Nicky Gumbel, who's the founder of the, of the Alpha Course, um, he says that uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit is a form of intoxication. Um, it's a sober intoxication. It's the only kind of intoxication that doesn't leave you with a hangover afterwards. Um, it's, it's not a one-off experience being filled with the Holy Spirit. You can be filled with the Spirit over and over and over again. And Nicky Gumbel also has a unique analogy uh, for Christians who have the Holy Spirit living within them and those who are um, clearly filled with the Spirit. And he compares it to an old gas boiler with a pilot light, and the pilot light is always on. Um, uh, my mom has a gas boiler like this, and it used to scare the heck out of my twin brother and I when we were kids. It would make these loud noises um, when it would turn on. And uh, you could hear these noises in the radiators throughout the house. My dad used to joke that there was a troll in the basement banging on the pipes with a crowbar. And, and that image is still stuck in my head. I feel like Kevin from the Home Alone movies. He's like scared to go in the basement. Um, uh, but when the heat comes on, uh, the pilot light's always on. There's always this, like, blue flame, basically, that's always glowing. But when the heat comes on, you hear, right? It kind of goes throughout the house, and you hear a sound. And so, Nicky Gumbel, that's what he says that being filled with the Spirit is. There's some Christians who are pilot-like Christians, and so they always have the Spirit within them. But then there are some people that are Christians, right? And you, you can tell when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, on the day of Pentecost, there was a group of people who were longing to be filled. They were longing to be filled with the Spirit. They'd been praying, and then suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. So all of them 
who were longing to be filled with the Holy Spirit were filled. Every single one of them. They were longing to be filled. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Um, so I would say that if you are in these seats today and, and you are longing to be filled, you are desperate to be filled, you will be. You will be. Still, there are some here today who would say that they're not longing to be filled, but they're receptive to it. You're, you're receptive to being filled with the Holy Spirit. And you'd have a lot in common with the Samaritan believers in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 says this, When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the people of Samaria had accepted God's message, they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands upon these believers, and they received the Holy Spirit. So these Samaritans uh, allowed themselves to be prayed for by Peter and John, and they received the Holy Spirit. So they weren't necessarily longing to be filled, but they were open to it. So I would say that if you're someone who is open but not longing to be filled, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit today. Um, still, there's some of you here that might be sitting here, and maybe you have your arms crossed, and you're hostile to being filled <laughs> with the Holy Spirit. Just hostile. You know, all this talk of the Holy Spirit is just not, like, connecting with you. And you don't really agree with any of this stuff, or it makes you very nervous. Um, you might be someone who says, I'm just kicking the tires of faith. I don't even believe in God, like right now. Um, well, if this message about the Holy Spirit is making you feel hostile, then you might have a lot in common with the person who became the Apostle Paul. Uh, he was there with Stephen, who was the first person to be murdered because of their faith, and he was, like, participating in Stephen's martyrdom. Um, and after that, he went around persecuting Christians, arresting them, um, and putting them in prison. And while he was planning to do more of that, he was on the road to Damascus, and he encountered Jesus. Jesus appeared to him in a blinding light. And Paul actually went blind while on the road. And this is what we read in Acts chapter 9. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers. Saul was, Paul was also called Saul. So Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He indeed is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem? And didn't he come to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priest? So here's Paul. He goes from a hostile individual persecuting Christians to someone who is filled with the Holy Spirit preaching the message of Christ. So you might say, Jordan, you know, I'm, I'm not longing to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm not particularly receptive to filling them with the Holy Spirit. I'm not really that hostile to being filled with the Holy Spirit. But I just don't understand it. I just don't understand it fully. I've been around Christian circles for a long time. I was baptized as a baby. I went through confirmation at my church. Maybe you're someone who uh, goes, goes to church once in a while. Or maybe you go every week but you just still don't understand this Holy Spirit stuff. Um, maybe this is your first time in a charismatic church, like the vineyard. In Acts chapter 19, we read about believers who had no understanding of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it says, While Paulos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus, on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied. We haven't even heard of this Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin. 
but John himself told the people to believe in the one who was coming later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. So you have these people that don't even know the Holy Spirit exists, and yet they are filled with it. The final group of people who may be here today are what Nikki Gumbel called the unlikely. And this just means that you're just somebody who says, that would never happen to me. In the biblical narrative, uh, in the ancient world, was divided into two groups. Um, Jewish people and uh, Gentiles, meaning everybody else. And so the Jews were the devoutly religious people, and the, the Gentiles were not the religious type. In Acts chapter 10, we read about the first occasion when a group of Gentiles were filled with the Holy Spirit. And this was shocking, because all of the first Christians were Jews. They didn't know it was possible for, for someone to be a Christian unless you became a Jew first. So they believed that the Gentiles were the most unlikely people who could be filled with God's Spirit. In Acts chapter 10, God gives a man named Cornelius a vision, who was a Gentile. And he also gave a vision to the Apostle Peter. And as a result of that, Peter came to his house and gathered a whole lot of people together, and all who were Gentiles, and Peter told them about Jesus and the cross and the resurrection. And while he was talking, this happened. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. So what happened here? What happened? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us that the experience of being filled with the Spirit is this. It's the love of God. It's the love of God being poured into the hearts by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Romans 5.5. 5. This is a good verse to memorize. Romans 5.5. 5. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. That's what these Gentiles experienced. They experienced God's love being poured into their hearts, and there seemed to be these physical manifestations of this. And this is what happened exactly to the disciples on the day of Pentecost. There were these tongues of fire, right? Tongues of fire of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes when people are filled with the Spirit, spirit in my experience, they experience something like fire. Um, people have often said that they feel heat in their hands and in their arms. And uh, if you learned about probability theory um, in school or prob probability calculus, you probably have heard of uh, Blaise Pascal. Uh, and Blaise Pascal was a French mathematician and philosopher, and he's a very important person in the history of mathematics. Um, so if you've studied binomial um, coefficients, you probably know about Pascal's triangle. Well, he converted to Christianity, and he became a fierce apologist for the faith. And after he died, um, there was a note that was discovered that was sewn into his jacket that he had written. Um, and he had written down this two-hour experience with the Holy Spirit, and it was so meaningful to him that he, he ne never wanted to forget it. So he wrote it down, and then he sewed it into the lining of his jacket. Um, so this was a note that was written on Monday, November 23rd, 1654. And we're, obviously this was in French, so we're, we're, we're reading it in English. Uh, from about half past ten at night until about half past midnight, fire. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and of the learned, certitude, certitude, feeling, joy, peace, God of Jesus Christ, my God and your God. Your God will be my God. Forgetfulness of the world and everything except God. He is only found by the ways taught in the gospel. Grandeur of the human soul. Righteous Father. 
The world has not known you, but I have known you. Joy, 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 tears of joy. I have departed from him. They have forsaken me, the fount of living water. My God, will you leave me? Let me not be separated from him forever. This is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God and the one that you sent, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And he wrote a lot more than that, but I can't read it all because we're just going to be going on forever. Um, But do you think that Pascal had an experience of the Holy Spirit? Sometimes an experience of the Holy Spirit is like the word for wind in Hebrew, which is uh, the same as spirit, and it's ruach. And uh, it's an monopoeia word, and actually, we talked about this actually in our small group um, the other day. It's kind of like the breath of God coming into a person. And sometimes, um, in worship even, you'll see people, and you can just tell that something is going on, right? You can see their eyes kind of fluttering, or it even feels like someone is kind of being blown over by, um, by a wind. And these are physical manifestations of the Holy Spirit that they experience on the day of Pentecost. A powerful wind. Now, these physical manifestations are powerful and meaningful, and there's nothing like being touched by the Holy Spirit, if you've had the experience. But these physical manifestations are not what it's all about. I want to I make that clear. They don't, they don't always happen, right? And sometimes we can overemphasize them too much. But if they do happen... Um, Don't be surprised, and don't be worried, um, because this does happen. It happened to Pascal almost 400 years ago. It's about God's love being poured into our hearts. That's what matters. It's not the physical manifestations. We are pursuing God, the Lord Jesus, our Father. We are not pursuing the manifestations. That's why we worship, right? This is why we worship on Sunday mornings. We all need to experience love. This is the deepest need, and everyone needs to experience love in their life, and this is what the Holy Spirit does. On the cross, we understand God's love for us, and we have a love for God that we want to express, and it overflows for God and for other people. So that's what worship is about. That's why we sing these songs that are mainly about God's love and about our love for God, and it's okay to express emotion in your relationship with God. It's okay to raise your hands in worship right? In the New Testament, it talks about raising holy hands, and it's in in prayer to God. That's a traditional form of prayer. So we are free to express ourselves in worship because of God's love. We even sing a song at this church called Free Worshipper, because that's how much we, you know, expect you to, to be emotional about it. And if you read on the day of Pentecost, they also received a new love language, a new love language. They started speaking in tongues, So it's important to say this first, not all Christians speak in tongues. It's not the mark of being a Christian. It's not necessarily the mark of being filled with the Holy Spirit. There's no kind of first-class Christian, the ones that speak in tongues, and then the second-class Christians, the ones that don't. It's not the most important gift of the Holy Spirit. But like in the Vineyard Movement, it's something that's very common, and it's one of the first gifts of the Spirit that we see manifested. Um, So... Sometimes it happens. And when Paul talks about tongues, he's talking about two different kinds of tongues. He's talking about human and angelic tongues. Angelic tongues are different than human tongues, where God gives us a language that we've learned, but it is a recognizable human language. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. But today, most of the languages that people have been given are a love language, and it's recognized as a language that the person has not learned. And the Apostle Paul says that it's a form of prayer, and that when he prays in tongues, his spirit prays. And in other words, it's a way of expressing what you feel without putting it in, like, human language or words. It's just a beautiful gift that God gives some people, and it's not compulsory. You don't have to do it. You can start and stop when you want to. Uh, Paul actually says that you shouldn't do it in a public meeting because you might start to speak in tongues and no one can understand it. So if you're going to do it in public, you need some kind of interpretation. But he says in private, he speaks in tongues more. And if you want to receive it, you can receive it today. 
It's not something that takes you over. You are in full control, and you can start and stop when you want to. But it's a beautiful gift, which is something that God offers that comes from the Holy Spirit. And it helps us express our love for Him in relationship. Amen? What are the barriers to being filled with the Holy Spirit? Worship team, you guys can come up. If you would like to be filled with the Holy Spirit, here's some of the things that might be going through your mind. The first thing is doubt. And doubt kind of goes something like this. If I asked, I wouldn't receive. Jesus says this in Luke chapter 11. Keep on asking and you will, you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. I think everyone includes us. If you ask, you will receive. So you say, okay, I'm convinced I would receive, but not, I'm not sure that I want it. Um, this is kind of like my sermon when I give uh, about prophecy. Do I have to? What would happen if something bad happens? What something bad happens? Jesus says this, he continues in Luke 11. You fathers, if you ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if you ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God's not going to give you something terrible. God wants to give you his Holy Spirit. Uh, can, can everyone stand with me? And um, can you just open your hands? I just want everyone to open their hands in a receiving posture, like you're getting something from God. And I'm going to ask for God to come and for the Holy Spirit to fill us. Everyone who is a Christian has the Holy Spirit. So I'm just asking that God stirs something in us. I've heard the analogy, it's almost like um, chocolate syrup in, in milk. You just have to stir it up. So I'm just going to invite the Holy Spirit to come and stir within our parts, in our hearts. And after I'm done, I'm going to, um, the worship team is going to read a, uh, lead us through a final chorus and, and, and Gino's going to come up and lead us in ministry time. Come Holy Spirit. Father, this world can feel very hollow at times. But I thank you that your love is as deep as the ocean. And Father, sometimes our lives feel like empty wells that are completely dry. So I ask, Father, that you would fill us and let us know how much you love us by filling us with your spirit. Father, we pursue you and you alone and we just want to be close to you. Wherever you are on the spectrum, whether we're longing, Father, whether we're receptive, whether we're hostile, whether we don't understand it, or whether we are just feel like the unlikeliest person in the world that you would give a touch to. I pray you would come.
there was ever a time when we needed peace, it's now.